Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Forrester. I'm a journalist, and I'm here to help guide you through the NDS Perspective Expert Panels. This morning, we're looking at design and usability. And we have three superb experts who are at the cutting edge of answering the problems concerning design and usability. On our extreme left, Olivier Lacour, Vice President Studio Design at NDS. In the center here, Nuno Sanchez, Head of TV Products from Zone in Portugal. Or Zon, I should say, really, shouldn't I? Zon in Portugal. And on my, uh, my right here, Brian Lenz, Director of Product Design and Development at B Sky B. Um, uh, I'm assuming most people, Brian, know B Sky B, but let me just ask Nuno to briefly explain Zon and what you're doing in Portugal. So, Zon is Portugal's largest pay TV operator. Uh, we were the incumbent on pay TV until a few years ago. Now we're an integrated triple play company. We have a very strong content arm, which is relatively atypical. And we're probably one of the few operators in the world that competes head to head with an IPTV FTTH operation in all of its territory. So I think that the most unique thing would be the extreme competitiveness of the market that essentially has led us to do a lot of the things we're doing nowadays. Right, uh, let's follow on from that, Nuno. Uh, there you are, you're running, a, you're running a pay TV operation and you have to start because you're introducing iDef or like Brian, you're contemplating or you've introduced 3D. Um, you have a clean sheet of paper. How do you address the problem of, of designing that entertainment experience to differentiate yourself from the, your, your competitors? So actually we start two steps before that. So what we start is, and the exercise we did is, what do we want to be in five to 10 years in a worst case scenario? So if OTT does become a mature industry where uh, anyone can access through any pipe all the content, what happens if content providers really as the saying goes, content wants to be free if they made it available and if international players that have a thousand times our market cap come into the, into the game. So that's the blank sheet we started. And what we said is the one thing we don't want to be is an infrastructure provider. Although that's, that's going to be in the base of the business always, we want to be someone that actually provides a relevant service and we want to have some unique assets to leverage upon long term. And the thing, the answer that comes from what are those unique assets actually leads us to the design, to the usability, to the product, and the way the people interact with the service. Because that's something we can have, that's ours, it's our intellectual property, it's dependent on our skills and our ability to understand the market. Content, infrastructure, and a lot of the typical pieces of the market that people used to compete on are actually available to all the players. Sure. And they're rel need to have, but they're not really the differentiating piece. Uh, Brian, how did you address this, the, the same problem? Well, I think first off, you need to figure out, are you addressing customers that already have a device from you? Or, and, and that's very important. Are we, do we have any, uh, it's good, but it's... OK. Um, I think the, you know, so the first question is, what, are the, what is the audience you're trying to go to? because you need to understand whether they are adopting something new on top of something you already have. Are you starting from a fresh, you know, fresh slate? So when you're building from the ground up, you have a chance to think a little bit more openly. When you're adding something in, if it's PBR functionality or on demand or you know, content discovery and social media, what you have to figure out is how to integrate that in in a way that doesn't ruin what their hab habit habitual interaction with the product is, with the TV is, but also allows them to discover it. And I think fundamentally that's the hard part, is start early to understand how are they going to first be introduced to something, and then how is it going to turn into the same sort of habit as channel tuning and everything like that. Uh, Olivier, uh, you're, you are inevitably asked to solve these problems every day. How do you advise your clients and how do you take them through what for some is a, an evolution but for others maybe a revolution? Well, we, we do it in a very, um, very unique way actually, uh, which is very simple. Uh, first of all, we have our own R&D 
which outputs every year uh, a Snowflake version. And uh, we consider that as, um, as a platform, a foundation for a relation. So from that, we have um, a very collaborative teamwork with uh, our client. And uh, it started with, uh, with Nuno. Um, and, uh, and we make sure that from this platform, we, we do a go-to-market, which is embracing um, the vision of our client, which embrace um, their specificities, both from a graphic perspective, feature, and ergonomic perspective. And from that, by proposing a long-term vision that is capable to be tuned according to their specific market, uh, we usually have a, a, good, a good, good answer. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, Mike Fries from uh, Liberty Media, Liberty Global, uh, showcased his solution for, uh, for cable uh, rolling across Europe uh, with a UI device, with a remote control, with just seven functions. Um, how, how aggressive are your clients in, uh, in seeking that degree of simplicity? <laughs> it's amazing how the remote control actually pictures the whole um, revolution of this industry which is ongoing. It is clearly an object that reflects um, the level of simplicity uh, that, uh, that both we and the client can achieve. Um, I think that Mike has been convinced that he has to go up to a very, um, you know, extreme point, <laughs> and uh, I cannot be more happy about that. And by the way, I think that uh, to a certain extreme, uh, there is no more uh, remote control. Uh, there is uh, access point to a service. Exactly. Uh, in all fairness you turn the remote over and there's a full QWERTY keyboard. Alors. So, <laughs> Alors. <coughs> so he's, he's hedging his bets uh, maybe a little in that yes, regard. Yes, that's... <laughs> it pictures where we are in this industry, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think that uh, well, <laughs> everything is said within the subject. Uh, Nuno, that, but that user interface, it's, it's crucial, isn't it? It's got... Uh, uh, kids of three will use something because for them it's very intuitive, but it's got to cope with that, 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 that uh, consumer demand right across the age group. Um, how, how do you solve those problems? Well, I think that we went through two very different phases in the way we address those problems. And I'll say we can we can put the I'll break them into two parts. One being the art, and the other one being the science. So we clearly didn't mix them. So we left the the art to a very well structured team that's led by Olivier, that included some people from our part, where essentially everything we believed makes sense was discussed, was distilled to its essence, was minimized to the point or keeping only the most relevant features, and that was essentially the core product. That product didn't really have a lot of consumer engagement at that point. That product was a piece of art, let's put it like this. From the day we put it out in the street for the first commercially available beta product, we, moved this, we completely moved to the other extreme, which was we went to the science, we looked, how does usability works? How do people look at this? Where, where, is there, where are their eyes when they're actually looking at things. Are their eyes on the title or in the image? Does the title even make sense to exist when everyone focuses the image? So I think that nowadays, user data, uh, analytical methods to actually support this kind of decision making only improve what the teams can do and what, how things get addressed. So how do kids interact with it? How do elderly? How do people who only consume typical linear TV? Those are things that we were happy to find that the sensitivity of the team that actually designed the excellent product was not far off, and that major tweaks could actually get right on the spot. So although there are no perfect processes, we're quite happy with the way that this ended up um, by following this sort of, let's not hold the team hostage of what the user thinks they need. Let's expose the user to what we believe it's best sure. for us, for the industry, for generating sure. our incremental revenue, and then let's see how do we adapt to what they actually respond to that. 
Uh, Brian, uh, your, your new boxes, your Sky Plus boxes, um, uh, they were, uh, well, behind the scenes uh, doing wonderful work, but actually the, your remote and your UI was very much an evolution, wasn't it? Not, not a revolution. Well, I think, uh, yeah, first thing is that we, we had this addressable base question, which is you don't want to break like I said, the habit of tuning to channel 401, you know, to go to Sky Sports. That's, that we realize that's the dominant way that people get to what they want to watch. But then you want to start to be creative and you want to start to add these new things in. So how do you add complexity? With simplicity. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a cliche way to say it, but ultimately, you want to continuously think of a way to make the complex intuitive and direct and easy to get to. And I think that's where kind of the art comes in. Yeah. And you, you can't really go to consumers and have them articulate very well to say, it would be so much better for this to happen that way and to get a consistent response across the base. So lots of people have different views. So you need to be in touch with the way people use your products. You need to observe, you need to you know, understand what are they ultimately trying to do, and then get smart people, smart designers, smart people to understand the art of the possible to come up with new ways. And then you go out and you test it. Like you don't go out and ask ask customers to design, design your product because you know you end up with a camel. You know, you know, it's a horse done, designed by committee. You know, sort of thing. And it's you got to be very careful, therefore, how you bring the consumer in while still keeping them first and foremost center in the, the objective. But had we been talking at this show two years ago, we might have sort of looked at uh, what was happening with the iPhone, smartphones. We, we would certainly have been talking about the portability of content, but uh, iPads didn't exist two years ago. Uh, one year ago, yes, they were, they were they're certainly getting some traction. And yet now it's commonplace and highly desirable. And people want to, uh, uh, the sort of simplicity that Apple has given us um, on, their, uh, on their regular TV set, the main TV set at home. Um, uh, how will you be incorporating those sort of uh, elements uh, as you go forward? Well, my, my view of the great thing about tablets and touch screens and smartphones is that it's actually turned convergence into a real opportunity. Absolutely. Because instead of turning convergence into it all must happen in one place, one device, it can all happen in one place on different devices. And you can go over the limits of that cheap and cheerful remote with the touch buttons and everything like that and make a richer engagement process and keep the screen to being the presentation. Absolutely. And so, ultimately, I believe that's the way that it's all going to go. Is the screen will become let the TV screen will become less and less the place where you're doing your interaction, and it'll be more the place where you're watching what you've chosen on on another device. Because nobody in the family likes to watch you go through the TV guide, you know, to find something. They all just want to get to watching something. <laughs> so if you're navigating and, and doing the the deep dives in that on the tablets, it's a great place to enhance the experience while still keeping TV center. Uh, Nuno, do you take a similar approach? Well, m maybe slightly different. So I think that the introduction of these devices, because we were on a revolution path, or not on an evolution path, was actually quite disruptive. We, were, we had launched a project a month before the iPad was launched. We were discussing the high level usability, and then that device comes up. And we're all like, maybe okay. we should account <laughs> from this from the beginning. <laughs> and actually what we did, there was a, a, a base principle that we've tried to follow in all our derivation, which is a UI needs actually to be independent from interaction uh, mechanism device. And that was actually at that point a relatively breakthrough concept because we were designing a TV UI, we were discussing a remote at the same time, and at that point we were asked to abstract from the remote. So actually think, does it work if you do it with your fingers? Does it work if it's in a laptop screen? And does it work in a laptop screen that you might touch with your fingers, but it's not on your lap, it's sitting here? So that discussion led to what the product that we have today, and it actually led a lot of design decisions. So our view is not as much as, will the user be doing one thing in one device? Will the user be doing another thing in another device? 
but how do we make sure that both experiences are maximized in both of them? Sure. And then we'll let the user choose. Uh, would he rather have the overlay graphics on, on the screen? And that needs to be optimized. Does he actually want to consume the concept on the laptop, uh, on the note, uh, on the um, iPad? Yes. Um, so we, I don't see them as re replacement in function. I see that they're both individual challenges to be tackled while maintaining, and this is the hardest part, as much as possible an absolute consistency. So you grab an iPad for the first time, if you've played with the TV product, the learning curve should be 10 seconds, and vice versa. And that prepares for a world with no set-top boxes, with laptops in the, with uh, everything's in the cloud, everything is in a holographic device that pops up, it doesn't really matter. Sure. So software becomes the product, the physical device, physical medium, physical interaction layer becomes the accessory that you customize to each case. Super. Olivia, you've got the toughest job here because um, on the one hand, we know from, from any consumer electronics show, any industry show like this, that there's no such thing as future-proof. You know, everyone is looking to replace as often as they can. But these guys don't want to replace their set-top box every 12 months. So you've got to look at the future. You've got to have some um, longer-term vision. Where do you see that longer-term vision uh, uh, influencing what these guys are going to be buying um, in their next generation units? <coughs> well, it's a, it's a tough but very interesting <laughs> job to start up with. <laughs> um, to actually dare to, um, to propose a vision, um, a solution to this industry which is uh, trying to revolutionize itself since years. So um, I, I couldn't be more happy to have the chance to, to try to address it, starting with that. Well, I think that uh, following uh, what has Nuno and, and Brian said on the iPad, I think that the whole um, paradigm shift is about um, considering devices as point of access to a cloud-based service. In that respect, uh, the iPad is not a remote control. The iPad is not a companion device since it creates a hierarchy between the TV and the iPad. It is at a given moment, to a given person, the best point of access to the cloud-based service, as the TV might be the best point of access to a cloud service while being in a different situation. So it pictures very clearly that something that we are showcasing within Snowflake 12. The fact that th the whole service, content, features, everything is cloud-based, and that you've got various access points and some are more relevant than others depending who you are, depending when and where you decide to log in. So this is uh, the move that I'm daring to do <laughs> <laughs> this year. Well, uh, we're, we're le we look forward to looking to seeing uh, some of this further work both at the show today uh, and, uh, and a year from now to see how it, uh, how it evolves. One final question and I must ask it. Um, uh, we're already in a, in a 600, 700, 1,000 channel universe. Can the EPGs cope with that choice and the huge choice coming in from, or potentially coming in from uh, outside the home? Uh, come f to you first, uh, Olivier. C can we cope? Can your systems cope with, uh, with that degree of choice? Well, I think that we, we, we kind of have the experience of infinity of choice on the internet already. Sure. So that's not something which is uh, conceptual. This is something that we actually practice every day. So I think that the TV industry have a, a lot to learn about uh, the way people are using the internet and uh, embrace uh, new habits and new, uh, new, new designs uh, from that. I think that the Horizon uh, platform is, is actually proposing a, a solution to that uh, by not considering that it's only about TV. Yes. The Horizon platform is, uh, is far more than that, and I think that uh, it pictures quite clearly what, what I think is, is the good way to go. Nuno, are you uh, happy with your vision as it stands as today? I think 
we, if there's one thing we struggle throughout the whole project, and when you're looking to the future, when you're looking to the web, look how the product evolves, is the fact that when you launch, you need to be rooted in reality. And reality nowadays is that dinner time, 85% of people watch the same five channels. And they want to zap through them pretty quickly. And that's the core use case of watching TV in 2011, 2012, 2014, and probably for a few years going down that path. So I think that it's not impossible to have the best of both worlds if we don't, keep, if we don't think that everyone is an Apple gadget loving web seeker, <laughs> content seeker like I am and probably a lot of the people in this show are. So we need to keep our feet rooted in reality a little bit for as much as that costs me on a daily basis. But then nothing stops us from actually going to what Olivia described and said, the way I address this is the same way I address the complexity of content on the web, which is if you want to go further than those 5, 10, 15, 20 core channels that I need to zap quickly, how do I provide how do I navigate through the infinite or near infinite content that the set-top box or all these devices will access? Search, you tackle into Facebook's famous, famous social graph, you tackle into the history, you tackle into, you, you place the, the, the intelligence on your side and you say, I'll need to provide the role of content discovery. I'll need to provide the role of content relevance. Still, I need to let them zap five channels really quickly and make sure if they press one in their remote, they see the newscast at eight o'clock. Yeah. So I enjoy having our conversation about how the future will look, <laughs> and then I enjoy discussing with the people who, the are, who are taking calls from the consumer and saying, how do you actually zap? <laughs> so we try to balance both sides. Brian, I, I can tell you that my 89-year-old uh, my mother loves your system. You know, she, she has no difficulty, but I'm not sure she's ready yet for swiping and, uh, and, 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 uh, and those, that, that degree of a step forward. However, well, I think, I think that's exactly right, which is that we serve everyone, so we can't just serve a niche. And we need to make sure that we design for the masses while still catering to the different use cases everybody has. I think in terms of are we all okay right now, um, no, we're not. Like if, you, if we don't accept that we're gonna have to change and evolve and expand, then we will, our role will go away because somebody else will do it. So as players in this space, I think you must create a vision. You have to have a design vision of what the experience is that you want across all the places that your customer is going to interact with you. And you need to create a design ethos that will allow you to add new things in while still catering for your 89-year-old grandmother and build upon that continuously. Just always, always, always put the user at the beginning of it and know that you're going to have to change and then try to change well. Yeah. Good advice. Gentlemen, our time is up. Well, I was given the wind-up note five minutes ago, so, so thank you for your, uh, for your patience. Um, Olivier from uh, NDS, Nuno from Zon, and Brian from B-Sky B. Great panel. Thank you very much.